Hi, I'm Robert Hunt, and you can probably tell that um, I'm not in my work clothes because there's nobody here at SMU, but I'm here, and I want to talk a little bit about Islam and um, the moral dilemma of worship as part of our Muslim Faith and Values series. Thanks. What's more important? Worshiping God or public safety? Does it show a lack of faith if you don't go to church or to the mosque or to the temple or the synagogue because you fear catching a contagious disease? All religious people face complicated choices when it appears that the command of God to worship leads the person or the community into danger. In the last few weeks, Christians in the U.S. have debated over whether to hold public worship services during the COVID-19 virus. Some have said it's a duty, that you lack faith in God if you fail to go to worship. One Baptist megachurch pastor here in Dallas effectively defied a citywide order banning gatherings of over 250 persons. On the other hand, the United Methodist Bishop asked his pastors to suspend worship services. Muslims face the same dilemma, and the way they approach it gives us a good opportunity to see Islamic moral reasoning up close. Just a day ago, a consortium of Islamic institutions supported a fatwa, or a legal ruling, about worship in a time of danger from contagious disease. It is worth considering their arguments to learn more about our Muslim neighbors. The document begins by strongly urging Muslims to take precautions against the spread of disease by suspending daily congregational prayer, the Friday prayers, and other gatherings. The scholars explain that they have done this after shared discussion, a review of relevant legal reasonings from the past, and the consideration of advice from government and medical experts. This approach represents well two basic principles of Islamic law. The first is the principle of, of seeking consensus with relevant authorities. The second is looking into the Islamic tradition itself for analogous situations and then drawing from the wisdom of that tradition. Muslims typically acknowledge what I believe G.K. Chesterton called the truest democracy, that which gives heed to the voices of the dead as well as the living. Their next step draws on the voice of tradition by stating clearly that protecting human life is one of the fundamental objectives of Islamic Sharia. Rather early in the Islamic legal tradition, Muslim legal experts argued that God's purpose in revelation is to serve the public interest. It does so by preserving the essentials of human well being religion, life, intellect, children, and property. This focus on the public interest and the protection of what is essential to the public interest gives Muslim scholars a principled approach to ethical decision making rather than one based purely on enforcing laws. The groups that issued this statement didn't stop with basic principles, however. They went on to show that the ruling had precedent in the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. Essentially, they argued that there's nothing new about this situation, that the Islamic tradition is familiar with the problems of modern people, and therefore it offers good guidance. It is reliable. And these two things, the Quran and the Hadith, are an important part of legal reasoning. You appeal, you appeal first to the precedent in the form of the Hadith, the saying of the Prophet Muhammad. His advice to his followers, in addition to the revelation of the Quran, make up the fundamental source of Islamic law. The Quran and the Hadith, along with analogy and consensus that I already mentioned, become the pillars of Islamic legal and ethical reasoning. And these allow Muslim scholars to come up with rational decisions in the public interest, which is what the classic Islamic teacher Al-Ghazali said was the basic need addressed by revelation. God reveals God's will to humans because God's will serves their interests. It is for their good. And thus God places human welfare even above worship. The closing paragraph of this statement, which can be found on the Islamic Society of North America's website, 
is also representative of the frame of mind Muslims are encouraged to adopt in times of adversity. It comes from the Quran, but it might be well found in Christian teaching as well. Here's what it says. Say this, nothing will happen to us except what God has decreed for us, and God is our protector. Let the believers put their trust in God. This is Robert Hunt for Muslim Faith and Values, a guide for Christians. Subscribe to this YouTube channel for regular updates on matters that help us better understand our Muslim neighbors. Thank you.